like we were. It's March 11th, 2014. This is Doug Stout. I'm here with Joseph Mike, Michael Demko, but he goes by Mike. Mike, where were you born? In Columbus. Okay. And what was your birthday? August 6th, 1949. Okay. And then what, what were you doing before you served in Vietnam? What were you doing before Vietnam? High school. Uh, I graduated from high school in 1967. I joined the United States Marine Corps on what they call the 120-day delayed enlistment plan. You signed up on the day of graduation, and 120 days later, after the summer was over, you would go to boot camp or basic training. Right. The Marine Corps doesn't have boot camp. They have basic training. So I went through uh, the summer of 1967 getting ready for uh, Marine Corps basic training. And I went in the Marine Corps August 28th, 1967. These dates, dates are dates that you never forget. Oh, I'm sure. And uh, arrived at the Marine Corps Recruit Depot in San Diego and went through my basic training, which was 12 weeks. And then upon graduation, I was assigned to Infantry Training Regiment, ITR. And I went through six weeks of ITR and then I was assigned to my basic infantry specialty, BITS, Basic Infantry Training School. I was an 0331 machine gunner. At the end of the uh, six week school, uh, we qualified with a machine gun and my scores in San Diego are still posted. I'm one of the highest scoring machine gunners in the history of the Marine Corps. Uh, we the day I graduated, I went to the hospital. I had pneumonia, walking pneumonia. I graduated from basic training, ITR, and basic infantry training schools with walking pneumonia. Wow. And uh, spent four weeks in the hospital. And to show how really naive I was, I, while I was in the hospital, I decided that if I got more training, the longer I could uh, delay my going to Vietnam, the more of a chance that Vietnam would be over. Now this is 1968. Right. And uh, so I signed up for recon. And I went to recon school, passed recon school in January, and found myself in Vietnam after a 30 day leave at home, just in time for the 1968 Tet Offensive. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't have wanted them to hold it without me. <laughs> what, what made you choose the Marine Corps? My father. Uh, my father was in the Army. He served with Patton in World War II in Europe. And he sat me down one day and told me, he said, son, you've had this label of citizen wrapped around you for the last 17 years. He said, now you're going to do something to earn it. So I didn't particularly like that idea. So I thought I'd stick it to my father, who was uh, United States Army. I went in the Marine Corps. <laughs> That's why I went in the Marine Corps. Not because it was a challenge or because right. I wanted the toughest or that kind of thing. Or there was a tradition of the family being in the Marine right. Corps. Right. I thought I would fix him. Okay. Did it fix him? <laughs> Did fix it... me. <laughs> yeah. <I'll bet. laughs> so, so you got to Vietnam in time for the Tet Offensive. Um, I mean, where were you there in Vietnam and, and that then when you landed? I landed in uh, Da Nang in a large Quonset hut and I was sitting in the Quonset hut waiting to be picked up by recon and a sergeant came in my platoon sergeant it turned out uh, walked in and he looked like he had been dragged behind a truck his uniform was a mess and here I am I'm you know fresh from the States starched uniform you know spit shined and he walked in and he walked over to three of us that were sitting in the Quonset and pointed one of them and he said, who are you? And he said, I'm Deerdorf from Cleveland. And he said, you're now with Golf Company 27, go out and get on the truck. And he looked at me and he said, who are you? And I said, I'm Demko, I'm Recon. He said, not anymore, get on the truck. So he picked me out of the Quonset hut to go on the truck to uh, Golf Company 27. I never served with a recon unit and it probably saved my life because the 1968-69 uh, was the highest 
casualty infliction on recon in uh, the Vietnam War. Uh, they took more KIAs, more wounded, but my Marine unit, Gulf Company 27, the year I was with them, took 146 killed. Now it's 146 out of 214. Uh, TO Company in the Marine Corps is 214 Marines. And in the year I was there, 146 of them were killed. My goodness. So you go out and get on. So are you the only new new replacement now? And yeah. How did how did? Well, Deerdorf and I. Okay. How did how did the other guys the the older guys how did they accept you? Was a lot of ribbon or? No, I was pretty much seen as uh, fodder. They the, the first thing I was told was, if you think you're going to live through this, get it out of your mind. You're nothing special. Uh, and, uh, of course, I was trained as a machine gunner. My scores are the best in the history of the Marine Corps. Right. And I, I arrived there, and they put me in mortars. And I didn't know anything about mortars. Right. So I spent four months in mortars until we went on an operation where we went in with 214 Marines. We walked out with 58. And uh, they needed machine gunners, and they put me in machine guns, which is where I really wanted right. to be anyway. Uh, it was training in the Marine Corps is everything and when I went through my basic training and my rifle training and all of that stuff I fired an M14 which is uh, almost like an M1 it's a smaller than an M1 but it looks a little bit like an M1 and that's what I learned to fire I got to Vietnam and they gave me an M16 uh, we called it Matty Mattel because it was plastic and right. that kind of thing. I had no idea how to take that rifle apart, to clean it, to service it, to make sure it worked. But I was given an M16 I'd never seen before, and that's what I carried my first four months in Vietnam when I was with mortars, walking around with a mortar that I'd never seen before, never learned how to fire before. Uh, and it was fortuitous for me because when I came back from Vietnam, uh, my first assignment was with the Second Marine Division in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, and I was made an armorer because I knew so much about different weapons. Right. I was made the company armorer, and and that's good duty. That the conflict that you talked about, whether you just came out with what 50, 50 some guys. What, this this is my Vietnam that I don't know. Mm -hmm. I know they call it hills. You mm -hmm. had hill battles. Did that have a name, or was it just a con? Was it just a battle, and it just didn't? It was an operation. Okay. And it had a name. It was called Allenbrook. Okay. Uh, Allenbrook was really the name of a general in World War II, uh, a British general, but they called the operation Allenbrook. We flew in with 214 Marines uh, in a helicopter assault, and uh, the VC were waiting for us. Somebody had leaked the fact we were coming. And our secured, so supposedly LZ, landing zone, was ringed by North Vietnamese. We landed, and they cut down the first chopper that landed. And, uh, of course, we're there. We got to get off the chopper. So everybody ran out, and that was my first operation. Uh, first four guys out of my helicopter, and I was like the sixth or seventh guy back, got cut down. And I think the only reason they didn't get me is because they were reloading. Uh, and it really pointed up to me what Espinoza said to me in the Quonset hut in uh, Da Nang. You're nothing special. You're probably not going to live through this anyway. And away we went. Uh, they spent a lot of time explaining to me how to live through the jungle. Because it's, uh, if you've never been to the jungle, it's oppressively hot, very humid. Everything there is working against you. Even the elephant grass, when you grab it with your hand and pull on it, it cuts into your hand. Uh, all the snakes are venomous. Uh, all of the, the animals are, have a bad attitude. Uh, so they were teaching us how to live through the, the jungle experience, uh, telling us things like nothing in the jungle grows straight. So if you see something that's straight, stay away from it. It's probably a tripwire for uh, 
booby traps and that kind of thing. Uh, first person I saw killed uh, in Vietnam was a guy that was walking behind me. And I was carrying a rifle and I carried the normal uh, military load of probably between 85 and 90 pounds. And he was carrying a radio. And he had that much extra weight. And you learn to walk in the footsteps of the person in front of you because if he made it through, you'll make it through. And there was an explosion behind me. And I turned around to look, and he had stepped on a bouncing Betty Mind. And the bouncing Betty Mind shoots straight up and goes off, blew his chest open. And when I looked down, he was laying on the ground with his chest open. His heart was still beating. It beat two or three times and then stopped. And it always hit me. That's how close I came to not being here. So they tried to teach you little things, uh, how to live through the, the experience of Vietnam. Mike, how do you how do you cope with the first time? I mean, the first time you saw I mean that guy and, and getting off the chopper and you know your your comrades being killed right in front of you. I mean, how? I mean, you're from Central Ohio. I mean, how do you cope with that? I mean, there's is there anything in life that could even prepare you for that? No. Uh, one of the things that they teach you in basic training is. You never know how you're going to react to combat. Are you going to be afraid? Are you going to run? Well, there was no need running in Vietnam. Half the time I didn't know where I was. There was nowhere to run to. Uh, But what they told you was, if you just do your job, you'll be okay. Just do your job. And uh, I, I adopted a philosophy when I first got there that I would never ask anyone to do something I wouldn't do myself. And that worked out very well for me, and also for my team when I, when I was given a gun team. Uh, I wouldn't let anyone in my team carry the gun, because when you open up in combat, the machine gun draws a lot of attention. And I didn't want anybody else to get killed doing something I knew I was trained to do. Right. Uh, but I would never ask anyone to do anything I wouldn't do myself. That, that was my, my mantra. Uh, I went to a reunion. This was kind of interesting. My daughter is a former captain in the Marine Corps. And we were going to have a reunion. Golf Company 27 was having a reunion at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. I keep saying Lejeune because that's the way the family wants it pronounced. We used to say Lejeune. Right. It's Lejeune. Uh, and I wrote the, co- or the uh, commanding general of uh, uh, Camp Lejeune and told him my daughter was a captain in the Marine Corps and we were coming on a reunion and I would like for my daughter to be assigned to us as our guide. And he did that. Gave her to us for the whole day. Uh, And I remember I arrived, I drove myself there. So I arrived in a car and all of these people who had been in 2-7 with me arrived in a bus. And uh, this is real emotional for me. One of the guys got off the bus, my A gunner, Barber. And he came over to me and he hugged me. And he said, You're the reason I'm home. And my daughter got to see that. Yeah. That was great. And that was how many years after? Oh, 30. Okay. 30 years. He never forgot. Never forgot. Never forgot. Now you told me how many how many battle action conflicts you were in in Vietnam. 17, 19? 19, 19, 19 major 19. combat operations. It's, I know you don't want to give a blow-by-blow blow of every combat the operation you were in probably, but is there anything that, that stands out in any of them that you, that you want to make sure that... Um, you know, people remember. You know, that's what we want. We want people to remember your service and the service of the men that were with you. Um, they can't speak for themselves. Um, so, is there anything in any of those that you'd like to share um, in your interview? Well, one of the things I would share is the Vietnam Wall in Washington, D.C. 
the, uh, the wall in Vietnam is shaped like a chevron and there are different panels on the wall and you can go and they have listed uh, if you're looking for a specific person on the wall they'll have the panel that he's on and the line down where he is and you can actually trace his name because it's embossed right uh, and the names aren't in alphabetical order the names are in order of death my first operation operation Allenbrook 22 men that arrived in Vietnam the same day I did died 22 people I knew and they're all listed together on the wall that's that's sobering when wow. you think there are 57,000 people on the wall but they're listed together by the date they died uh, and it, you know the, the Vietnam War really has a bad rap in our country uh, because a lot of people came back and they didn't assimilate well back and they didn't give back to their community the way they're supposed to the way they should the way they're taught in the, in the military to do uh, one thing I would want people to remember all the things they've read all of the things they've seen we never lost a fight the uh, Tet Offensive was advertised in the United States by CBS News and a lot of other uh, news organizations as a loss for the American military. It was actually a huge win for at least two months after uh, the Tet Offensive was over the VC and the NVA could not mount operations in Vietnam because they were out of people. We won that. We didn't lose it. Right. They showed the same picture six days in a row in, on the national news of a plane burning on the runway at Khe Sanh. In the entire history of Khe Sanh, the firebase, only one plane was ever shot down, and it wasn't shot down, it was shot up on the runway. But they showed that three days in a row burning mm -hmm. to make it seem like we had lost three planes that, you know, during the, the Tet Offensive. Uh, we took a lot of pride in, in what we did. Uh, there, there were a lot of drug use in Vietnam, but not so much among combat veterans. Uh, you don't go in to combat high on drugs, because if you do, you don't come out. And uh, we very, very much discouraged drug use in our unit. Uh, that was one of the worst things that could happen to you. If we found out you were using drugs, you were out of the unit. You were sent somewhere else. Uh, and we got someone to replace you. And uh, I don't care how good in combat you were, how good you were at being a Marine, right. if you were using drugs, you were gone, yeah. period. Uh, so I would want people to understand that the American military took a lot of pride in the service that they had in Vietnam, and nobody ever whooped us. I, th I thought I heard a statement that Vietnam wasn't a geographical battle. It wasn't, you know, you didn't take a hill and sit on it and keep it because it wasn't about the geography. It mm -hmm. was about basically casualty. I mean, mm -hmm. hurting the enemy. Um, would, is that something that I'm, I'm remembering or hearing correctly, you think? Oh, yeah, that's correct. William C. Westmoreland, four-star general, mm -hmm. decided that he would prosecute the war in Vietnam on a body count. And so when you were sent out, the idea was to kill as many as you could, and then when the firefight was over, you went out and counted them. But what they didn't tell you was that they would send three or four people out. They couldn't send everybody out to count, but they'd send three or four people out to count, and they'd give them security so they'd go out and count bodies. And one would come back and say, I counted 15 bodies. Another guy would come back and say, I counted 20. Well, 15 of that was the same 15 the other right. guy counted. But they said, well, that's 35. And, it, you know, that's how they were doing the body count. It was inflated. Right. And it was inflated for political purposes. They felt that they were going to win the war with body count. And that, that's not how you win the war. Uh, we didn't take uh, land. We didn't take objectives and keep them. Right. And the, the story about that is uh, when you look at the after-action report that I gave you for Mead River, Mead River took place in, in an area called Go Island. 
We were in Go Noi Island on operations four times when I was in Vietnam. And all four times that we went to Go Noi Island, we took what was called a statistical wipeout. And a statistical wipeout was 75% casualties or more. And the first one we went to was Allenbrook. We went in with 215 Marines. We walked out with 58. Uh, they had a bunker complex that we had to go through. And there was a railroad trestle that went across the median area of Gonoi Island. And the first time we got there, I was told by the old salts, the, the guys that knew what was going on, they said, if we get to the railroad trestle and we haven't hit anything, we're in trouble. And that meant that they were waiting for us on the other side of the railroad trestle in bunkers. Okay. So we arrived at the trestle and we were going to go across and assault into this bunker complex that we all knew was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we walked in with the 1st and 2nd platoon online with 3rd platoon in reserve. We walked in and the 1st platoon hit the bunker complex and we backed out, flopped the 3rd platoon over and the 2nd platoon where 3rd platoon was and walked in again. And then 2nd uh, platoon pretty much got wiped out and we pulled back and we took everybody that was left in the first two platoons, put them together, put them on the right, put third platoon on the left. And I remember my A gunner said, what do we do? And I said, pray. And we went in and they had left. They had us, but they pulled back. Evidently they had enough of us. Right. You know, we just wouldn't give up. But we went to Gonoi Island four times and four times we took statistical wipeouts. The last time we went to Gonoi Island I was on R&R &R in Hong Kong and when I got back there wasn't anybody in my gun team or in uh, the weapons platoon that I knew. They were all dead. Oh my gosh. All dead. Did, did that have an effect on morale that you had to keep taking like going back to that island and cleaning it out I mean or because you didn't they didn't let you just take it clean it out once and it's clean and, and move on did that and stay yeah did that affect morale or or what was morale like over there I mean we see so much in TV and movies and there was a quiet resignation in a lot of the units that you're nothing special you're not gonna live through this and my second operation in Vietnam, we took a lot of casualties. I didn't think I was going to live through Vietnam. I did not think I was going to make it. We took a statistical wipeout and they took our unit and put them on ships off the coast of Vietnam. Uh, we were put in, and, and you'll see it on my expanded DD-214, I was in what's called a BLT, a battalion landing team. Okay. And we were on board the ship and if a marine unit in country hit a large Vietnamese unit, they would bring us up on the deck, get put us on helicopters and fly us in to help them. And that's why I was in so many operations. They, we were in and out a right. lot. But to be honest with you, I don't sail well. And I was seasick the whole time we were on board the ship. I was praying for combat because I was so darn seasick. Right. That, you know, a lot of times it's just uh, fatalistic gallows humor, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but when I was going through recon school and they gave us parachutes and we were going to parachute out of a helicopter for the first time, I asked, and it, this probably happens in training a lot, but I asked one of our instructors, I said, what happens if my parachute doesn't open? He said, you can always bring it back for a refund. <laughs> That's the kind of gallows humor right. you get. Uh, doesn't help you cope with it any, right? But uh, that's what they tell you. You know, uh, Marines are fanatical about being Marines, and uh, Espinosa, my platoon sergeant, whenever we'd go on an operation, before we left, he'd always say, "What's the worst that could happen?" That that was his thing. He made it all the way through Vietnam without a scratch. Wow. All the way through without a scratch. And his big thing was, what's the worst that can happen? So I've in, in my life, I've kind of assumed that kind of an attitude. 
uh, in everything that I've done, everything that I've been involved in, I've always thought, well, what's the worst that could happen? And in some instances, the worst that could happen has happened. Right. But in most instances, it hasn't. We, uh, as individuals, worry about things that may never happen. And we worry about things that when they happen, they're not half as bad as we thought they were going to be. Uh, I currently have diabetes from Agent Orange exposure in Vietnam. And the diabetes had decided to la land in my eyes. And I have non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And I go every four weeks and get injections of steroids in my eyes. And I told my doctor the other day, I said, you know, when I was a kid, I said, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. I never thought I really was going to do it. Uh, so you just, you accept what comes. Uh, you can't change it. Uh, one of the things that I did tell my CO, uh, I got hit once in Vietnam and refused a Purple Heart. And he said, well, why would you refuse a Purple Heart? Because that's a very prestigious sure. award in the military. And I said, because my newspaper at home had a habit of listing casualties. And I said, I don't want my mother reading in the paper that her son got hurt before I had a chance to tell her. Right. I won't take it. And he wanted me to take it. He really gave me a hard time. And I told him, I said, well, a Purple Heart is really a marksmanship medal for the Vietnamese that we wear on a uniform. So when I told him that, he decided, yeah, you're probably right. You don't need to have one. But uh, in the entire time I was in Vietnam, uh, 12 months, 20 days. No one that I led ever got killed. And I took a lot of pride in that. I guess you should. Did you ever get your Purple Heart? No. You still haven't taken it? I won't take it. No way. Even though you're not worried about mom and the paper and everything else? No, won't take it. And it's too late to get it now anyway. But no, I won't, I won't take it. For the same reasons? Well, no, through the years, my feelings have kind of evolved. Okay. Remember I told you uh, that the guy behind me stepped on a bouncing yes. Betty and was killed? That's where I took a little shrapnel in my arm. And my thought was, this guy laying on the ground, who's now dead, is going to get a Purple Heart. That, that's all. That's all he'll get is a Purple Heart. And he's dead. And I've got this superficial wound on my arm. I can't accept a Purple Heart for this. And he's going to get a Purple Heart for giving his life. I just, no way. Can't do it. And you were, how, how old were you when you, when you were in Vietnam? Uh, like 18. 18. 18 years old. 18. Turned 19 in Vietnam. Uh, I had, my, my birthday's in August. I had my entire gun team singing happy birthday to me on my birthday in the middle of a firefight. Oh my goodness. And, it's, you know, it's one of the, the big memories that I have of Vietnam. Well, I would think so. Let me pause that. I'll get you some more coffee. So, so you, so you finally got out of Vietnam. Yep. Um, with, now, how did you, how did they decide when you could leave? Uh, the Marine Corps, uh, the Army served a year tour of duty. The Marine Corps served 12 months, 20 days. And the, Marine, the Marines served 12 months, 20 days because the Marine Corps is a part of the Navy. Okay. Uh, a friend of mine told me the Marine Corps is a department of the Navy, and I said the men's department. <laughs> uh, but the Navy takes you everywhere you go. And it was 10 days steaming time from the States to Vietnam and 10 days back. So that's 20 days. So you spent a year and 20 days, 12 months, 20 days. But they needed us so quickly in Vietnam that they started flying us there. So we would leave and get there almost the same day. But they still made us serve 12 months, 20 days. Right. And they would give you a short timers calendar when you arrived there. It was a black and white paper with color by the numbers uh, and as you filled in the numbers a picture would come uh, into view and what you would do is every day you would color in a different place 
on this calendar. It was a short timer's calendar. And you knew when you were due to go home. So 12 months, 10 days, normally they pulled you out of a combat area so that you didn't wind up getting killed the last day right. while you're in Vietnam. And uh, they would bring you to Da Nang and they would put you on a plane and fly you home. Uh, I literally, because they couldn't get us out, we were in combat. I went the full 12 months, 20 days with a combat unit and was flown out the day I was supposed to fly back to the States and put on an airplane in Da Nang and flown to El Toro, California and then put on a plane and from, flown from El Toro, California to Columbus, Ohio. I went from combat to home in two days. That is a shock. That was a, that's a big shock. I had requested, uh, about the last week I was in Vietnam, of my CO to stay for six months, to extend my stay in Vietnam because everybody in my, my gun team was going to rotate back to the States at the same time. They arrived later than I did, right. and I wanted to rotate with them. Uh, I really felt guilty. I thought I was leaving them. And uh, he said, go back, get home. After you've been home for 30 days, if you still want to come back, just contact a recruiter. He said, I'll get you back to the unit. When I landed in Hawaii, coming back from Vietnam, mini skirts had just come into style. There was such a gasp on the airplane, all these military people flying in. We depressurized that, that plane. <laughs> and I decided I was not going back for another shot and uh, went home. How, I mean, I, other vets I've talked to, their reception coming home from Vietnam has been okay. Some have just had horrible things done to them and said to them, how, how was your, how's been your, what's happened to you? Well, one thing you'll, you'll notice, I don't have a lot of pictures of me in uniform. Right. When I got home, I didn't wear a uniform. Uh, very rarely did you see me in uniform. Uh, I landed in Columbus and caught a cab home. And I ride home in a cab, and as I'm getting out of the car, in my Marine Corps uniform with my ribbons and all of that stuff, the guy looked at me because I, I had been in the tropics for a year. I was dark brown. I was really suntanned. Mm -hmm. And he said, where are you coming from? And I said, I just spent a year in Vietnam. And he goes, oh, and you made it home? Congratulations. That was my welcome home. When I landed in Vietnam, Braniff International was the airlines that took me to Vietnam. I celebrated terrifically when they went out of business. The uh, flight attendant, when we landed, said, you are now in sunny Da Nang, South Vietnam. The temperature is 120 degrees in the shade, if you can find any shade. She said, we look forward to seeing most of you on your way home. That was my welcome to wow. Vietnam. So, did, did that make you want to, I don't want to say hide your service because of what was going on here at home? But No, one of the things that I tell people is I was a Vietnam vet long before it was fashionable. Uh, I've, I've always uh, advertised openly the fact that I was a combat veteran from Vietnam. There's a difference between being a Vietnam veteran and a combat veteran. There are a lot of people who are military service people who served in the military during the Vietnam era, but there aren't as many that served in combat. Uh, and I respect people who've served in combat very much because I know what it took to be in combat. Uh, a friend of mine, Colonel Tom Moe, who is a uh, POW, the first time I met him, he served with John McCain in the Hanoi Hilton. Okay. The first time I met him, I asked him, I said, when were you shot down? And everybody walked away from us. And he looked at me and he hit the table 
And he said, I was not shot down. <laughs> and I said, what happened? He said, the, uh, the wing of my plane fell off because a civilian contractor used the wrong bolt on the wing. He wasn't shot down. His wing fell off and, and he landed. So he was very, very sensitive about being shot down. He was not shot down. Uh, Tom Moe was not shot down. Uh, but uh, I think that the big thing is the Vietnam veterans are very proud of their service. I get very irritated when I hear a Vietnam veteran say, well, we didn't get a parade. Uh, and you'll hear that a lot. You know, that there's no parade for a Vietnam veteran. You don't get a parade if you lose. And actually, when you look at the Vietnam War, we did lose. And uh, here's my theory on why we lost it. In Korea, we started treating our service people as temporary uh, service people. People would arrive in Korea and they would build up points. And when you got a certain number of points, you could go home. Uh, so you weren't there for the duration. You were there for however long it took to get your points. In Vietnam, you were there for 12 months, 20 days, 12 months, however long your tour of duty was, and you went home. All you were trying to do in Vietnam was survive the experience. You didn't care if we won. You didn't care how it turned out. You just wanted to go home. And that has built into the military a lack of an understanding of what it takes to win. My father, when he went to Europe in World War II, he was in Europe for three years. He was there for the duration. He wasn't coming home until they won. Right. Uh, so, you know, big difference in philosophy. Sure. Uh, and I really think that when you tell people you're going to be somewhere for a year, you start looking forward to the day when you're going to come home. Uh, that's why most people, most people got killed in Vietnam the first couple of months they were there or the last couple of months that they were there. And the reason for that is the first couple of months you didn't know anything. The last couple of months you thought you knew everything. And you know you were just trying to hang on until right. you could go home. Uh, 57,000 military people died in Vietnam and uh, many of them were in their first couple of months or the last couple of months. When you came home, how, I mean, because you were home, like you said, so quick, mm -hmm. how, how long did it get to, to where you felt you could relax, for maybe a better word, I don't know, but to where you felt, okay, I'm a civilian now and I'm, I'm okay now, everything's, I'm okay. You know, one of the things that I said in Vietnam a lot when we get into problems or tight situations, I'd look at Espinosa, who always said, what's the worst that could happen? My re response to that was, well, they can't kill me or eat me. <laughs> and I went to work for the FBI. And we always said the FBI meant friendly but ignorant. And I went to work for them in Washington, D.C. And a couple of times I saw J. Edgar Hoover. And every time I saw J. Edgar Hoover, I would put my Eddie Haskell face on and I would look at him and say, <laughs> good morning, Mr. Hoover. And he would just get real mad and walk away. And uh, the special agent one time told me, he said, don't make the director speak to you. It gets him upset. And I smiled and I said, well, what can he do? He can't kill me or eat me. And he said, he's the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. If he wants you killed, I'll kill you. If he wants to eat you, I'll cook you. Uh, but it, it's kind of a fatalistic thing. Nothing that can happen to me in life can intimidate me. It's, uh, my daughter is a former captain in the Marine Corps. She served in Iraq, she served in Kuwait, she served in Africa. Uh, she served more time in combat than I did. And one of the most intimidating things that ever happened to me was to have my daughter call me on the phone and say, Dad, I'm going to war. But she understands that fatalism. Mm -hmm. She is right now suffering from stage four breast cancer and she's going through the treatments. And her attitude is terrific, absolutely terrific. And uh, you know, I asked her, I said, you know, this is really a fight. This is as big a fight as you did sure. in combat. 
how are you keeping your spirits up? She goes, Dad, I could have died a long time ago. It's, it's not up to me. So you do get a certain fatalism. There isn't anything that can happen to you when you get back that's anywhere near as bad as could have happened to you there. Uh, when I interviewed for the Reynoldsburg Police Department, I'm a former police officer, my chief asked me in my interview, he said, can you shoot to kill? Very simple question. And I said, yes, sir. And he smiled and he said, Mike, you answered that way too quickly. And I said, you haven't read my resume, sir. I said, I decided that a long time ago. Uh, people today, young people, have these tragedies that happen in their life. Their iPod fails, you know, right. that's a tragedy for them. For me, a tragedy was losing 22 of my friends in combat. Uh, it's easier to go with the flow and kind of roll with the punches. Mm -hmm. You know, young people have no idea what it is to meet a fear and work through it. Winston Churchill once said, you've never really lived until you've been shot at and missed. Uh, and, and that's true. You yeah. see the sun up in the morning a lot different. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, you know, I can't imagine. I, nobody's ever shot at me. Mm -hmm. Nobody's ever come at me and tried to kill me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just cannot imagine from what you tell me and what, I, what the statistics that you're telling me, just flat out, I don't know if I could come back. I don't know if I could come back and do what vets have done mm -hmm. and, and help then build in the communities that they're in. Now you came home and what were you still then in the service or were you done with your service career to then? No, I was still in the service. Okay. I, I went to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina and they gave us an early out, a year early out. Uh, Marine Corps you enlist for four years with two years active reserve. Okay. And they gave us a year early out. For every year you spend in Vietnam, you got a year early out. And I took my early out because I had been recruited to come to work for the FBI in Washington, D.C. Okay. Uh, and, and the story I think I already told you about that, uh, I had two years of active reserve to do. So I filed paperwork with the FBI that I had to have two weeks off every summer for active reserve training. And my special agent told me, he said, no, the old man will get you out of that. And I said, no, you don't understand. This is the United States Marine Corps. Right. I've got to go through training. Uh, a couple of weeks later, I get a letter from the Commandant of the Marine Corps. And the letter stated that uh, J. Edgar Hoover had identified my job with the FBI as essential to the mission of the FBI. And he could not release me for my two weeks of training. So the Marine Corps, in order for me to live up to my reserve training, reactivated me as an active Marine. And I served as an active Marine while I served with the FBI all the way through. So I actually have two discharges from the United States Marine Corps. Uh, every time I got promoted with the FBI, I got promoted in the Marine Corps. I don't wear the rank that I had when I got out because I feel I earned corporal. But I was actually a staff sergeant when I got out. So you were with the FBI how long? Four years. Four years. Mm -hmm. And then what did you do? Uh, I joined the Reynoldsburg Police Department. Did you just want to come back to Central Ohio or just wanted to change your pace? or? I'd always wanted to be in law enforcement. Okay. Uh, it's one of the goals in my life. I wanted to be a police officer. And I came to Reynoldsburg, the funny story, I came to Reynoldsburg, they had one position available. And I took the police test and I tied for the top score with another person named Bob Britt. So they were kind of wondering, who should we take? You know, we have Mike, he's got FBI, and Bob Britt had former uh, private security training. You know, they, a lot of the stuff we did was the same. He was airborne, I was recon, you know. Okay. Uh, and the chief dropped dead. So now they had two positions available. <laughs> And they hired both of us. Sorry, that's not funny. <laughs> but the rumor was that Demko had killed the chief so that he could come to work for the police department. It, that was it was funny. What year was that? Mike? That was uh, 1974. Okay. 
And then so did you retire? Is that where you retired from, the Reynoldsburg Police Department? I left the Reynoldsburg Police Department in 1981. Uh, I was selected in 1976 when I graduated with honors from Columbus State to be the crime prevention officer for the city of Reynoldsburg. And I did that for four years. And at the end of four years, when I first took the job, the chief asked me, what's your goal as a police officer, as a crime prevention officer? I said, to work myself out of a job. Four years later, he called me in the office, sat me down, and he said, Mike, he said, you've worked yourself out of a job. He said, the crime rate in Reynoldsburg has reduced to the point where we can't justify a full-time crime prevention officer anymore, and they put me back out on the street. Wow. And I started looking around for uh, a job in business because I wanted to do crime prevention. I really enjoyed it. Right. And I found a job with a convenience operation in Ohio, and I went to work for them as their director of security. And I worked for them for five years. And then I got recruited by Licking Memorial Hospital to come to work as their director of safety and security. So I came here. And I was here for a year, and they decided that they didn't need the safety and security officer anymore. And they did away with the program and laid me off. So I went back into business. I went to work for the Limited and worked for the Limited for a while. And then I was the director of public safety for Ohio Dominican University, where I graduated from. And then I went to work for Value City Department Stores as their corporate director of safety and security. And I worked for them for 10 years. And I came back here to be the director of public safety for the Ohio State University here in Newark. And I did that for four years, and I figured it out. I had enough time in government service and law enforcement to retire, mm -hmm. and I'm now retired. Right. Uh, but that's that's kind of where I've been, what I've done. You you told me a story, and I want want to make sure everybody hears about uh, your trip to Walter Reed. Yes. You can tell that story again. We, we, we're going to have the picture on your file. Of of it, but if you can tell that story again, please. Okay. Um, back in 2008, I was working with Ohio Vets United to get a Gold Star license plate established in Ohio. And that Gold Star is for families that have lost members of their family in combat. It has to be combat. And we, we were able to get that developed. And I was offered an opportunity to go and visit Walter Reed over Christmas. Uh, 2008. My daughter was a captain in the Marine Corps at the time and I called her and said we're going to Walter Reed. And uh, an interesting sidelight to that, they asked my daughter not to wear her uniform at Walter Reed because uh, she was a captain and these wounded veterans who had lost limbs and you know really mangled, broken bodies would struggle to come to attention if an officer walked into their wards. And so she didn't wear a uniform. Right. Uh, you'll see in the picture that she's not in her uniform. Right. Uh, I told E. Gordon Gee uh, that I had an opportunity to go to Walter Reed, but I wanted to represent Ohio State University at Walter Reed. And he sent a large banner, a uh, great big large banner of Ohio State and COTC to be taken to Walter Reed. So I went to Walter Reed and we stretched this banner out in front of the front doors of Walter Reed Hospital. And the sergeant that was with us as our tour guide was recovering from traumatic brain injury. And he asked me, he said, can we keep the banner? Well, I had to think about that because the banner didn't belong to me. But I was a representative of Ohio State and I said, yeah, keep the banner. I said, but you can't hang the banner in any recovery ward that has a Michigan fan in it. So I came home and got a call from E. Gordon Gee. And he said, where's my banner? <laughs> and I said, well, I gave it away. And uh, there was a pause on the phone. And he said, what did we get for the banner? I said, well, let me tell you a story. I have a lot of stories. Right. Uh, the sergeant that was with us, suffering from a traumatic brain injury, while we were walking around and talking to him, this big, broad smile came on his face. And I'm a corporate investigator. I look at body language and you know facial expressions, that kind of thing. And I said, what just happened? 
And he said, well, he said, I'm suffering from traumatic brain injury. And when people talking to me use words, I have this file cabinet in my mind and the file folder or the file drawer opens and file folders come out and things start popping out of them. And I said, well, I, I don't understand. Tell me what you mean. And he said, I said, what word did I use? He said, you used the word because. And I said, well, how does that set you off? And he said, well, if you remember, he said, the Wizard of Oz. He said, when my file drawer opened, the file folders came out, and the munchkins from Munchkin Land start jumping out and singing because, 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 because of the wonderful things he does. So I understood how the mind works after a traumatic brain injury. And I came home from Walter Reed, and there, there was a young man that I knew. I won't use his name because he's in the area. Right. Uh, but he was a uh, law enforcement candidate, and he had wrecked an ATV, crushed his arm, and uh, had a traumatic brain injury. And I walked through the cafeteria one day, and he was sitting there with tears running down his face. And I said, what's the matter? And he said, I just, these newsreels go. All these newsreels go. And I said, well, I, don't, I understand what you're talking about, but tell me what you mean. And he said, my professors will say something in class, and a newsreel will start, and things from my childhood will come out. And uh, I said, Travis, when I was at Walter Reed, they told me that you have to let it go. Just let it play out. You can't stop it. The more you fight it, the more frustrated you get. You have to let it play out. And I saw him a couple days later, and I said, things going better? And he said, yeah, things are going better. And I told E. Gordon Gee, I was able to help a student because of my visit to Walter Reed. That's what Ohio State got out of my visit to Walter Reed right. Hospital. And it, students are everything. Yes. Students are everything. So that's my story about Walter Reed. And and now you're an author. You've authored two books so yes. far and you're gonna be working on another one. I'm working on a third. And you told me something else that you're trying for TAPS across America? Uh Bugles Across Bugles America. Bugles Across America. Can mm -hmm. you explain a little bit about what that is? Bugles Across America was established because they discovered that uh, there were very, very few people who had the time or the inclination or the uh, wanting to play taps at military funerals. So much so that they developed a bugle that had a tape recorder in the bell and you would hit the tape recording and hold the bugle up to your lips and the tape recording would play taps. And I thought, you know, the one thing that uh, a service person should have when they die is someone actually rendering that military courtesy. The other thing I found out was people holding these bugles up to their lips and not playing were charging anywhere from $150 to $300 to fake taps at funerals. So uh, I'm a trumpet player. Uh, I played trumpet when I was in high school, took number two in the state, uh, tried out for the Marine Corps Band and you know all that kind of stuff. Right. And I'm trying to get my lips in shape because I want to be a member of Bugles Across America. I want to play taps at the funerals of veterans here in Licking County. But the other thing is I've committed that I will not charge a dime to play. So that's my story about right. Bugles Across America. That's really good. I'm sure we could both, I could, I, I could sit and listen all day to every story you've mm -hmm. got. Um, what, what do you want somebody that's listening to this to remember, to truly remember about a Vietnam vet, combat vet, Vietnam combat vet? Remember this, uh, because there's been a lot said about combat veterans that freak out and, you know, have problems. If you went to Vietnam and you had your head screwed on right, you came back from the experience okay. But if you went to combat and your head was a little off bubble, you were way off bubble when you got back. We have a lot of Vietnam veterans in this country that are broken. They're broken because of their service. They're broken because of the combat they saw. They're broken because of the way they were treated when they came home. Uh, they have been broken in a number of different ways. Understand that these people had a very traumatic thing happen to them in their life for a year. And the, you know, a lot of people can't handle traumatic things that happen for a week. But for a year, that's 
uh, a lot. Uh, they had to come to grips with the fact that they could die at any time. Uh, the combat that I took part in, there were many times when I didn't think I was coming back. Uh, and then there were times when there were a lot of people who didn't come back. Right. So you wonder, what did I do? You know, what am I supposed to do when I get back? And my thing is you have to give back to your community. Serving as a police officer and crime prevention officer of the year, police officer of the year, those things were paybacks to the community. Uh, things that I was willing to do uh, going to Walter Reed is a payback. Mm -hmm. uh, just understand that uh, many of our Vietnam veterans are struggling with how can I give back? And I, I explained to you, Lou Holtz once told me, he said, develop 250 things that you want to do in your life. And, and make them big things. Don't make them small things. Uh, and I picked 250 things I wanted to do in my life and they were things like I wanted to have dinner at the White House. I've been able to do that. Uh, I wanted to take part in combat and survive. Uh, the big one that I'm working on right now is I want to marry for life. So have those goals. Have that bucket list of things that you want to accomplish in your life. What, what can the general public do to make that, to make that easier on or do we make it easier on a Vietnam vet? I mean, what can we do? I mean, I, sometimes I feel like we've kind of come full circle that now we maybe are coming, I hope, coming to grips a little bit with a Vietnam vet um, and how to treat, I don't know. Something that's very awkward for me, but I've done a lot. Uh, when people look at you and you've got some type of a military insignia on, and they ask, they thank you for your service. That to me is very uncomfortable. Uh, but I've done it. Right. Uh, a little story that I hadn't shared with you. The first gold star that I saw on a license plate after I had worked for, worked for the gold star license plate, I saw in a parking lot over at the old Meyer store. And I waited for the gentleman to come out and the guy came out and, and went to the car, and I walked up to him, introduced myself, told him I had worked with Ohio Vets United to get the Gold Star license plate passed in Ohio. I said, I'm, I'm responsible for that Gold Star on your license plate. And he started to cry. And he told me he lost his son in Vietnam. That was 40 years ago. Right. He said, I never got over it. I think of all those families, never got over it. Understand that they're for every death in Vietnam, all 57,000, there are families that may still not have gotten over the loss of that, that person. Yeah. But uh, we stood in the parking lot hugging each other, both crying. How bad. Do, do you think, do you think America, the United States has gotten better recognizing the Vietnam vet or are, I don't want to be thought of as special. My dad spent four years in Europe and came home. And it, it, it's funny, my dad told me when, uh, when I went to Vietnam, he said, don't come home with any medals. He said, the only time you have to win medals is you do something stupid and you've got to do something to brave, get yourself out of it. He said, don't come home with any medals. My dad went to Europe and fought in Patton's Third Army. He arrived in Europe as a private first class. He arrived home from Europe a private first class. 
He was there for four years and never got promoted. Never got any type of recognition for the, his service. And uh, I just, I would want people to understand that uh, there are people that are broken. They didn't spend a lot of time in combat, but a Vietnam veteran spent more days in combat than a World War II veteran spent in combat. So just understand that they're, it's very difficult sometimes to talk about your service. Right. Uh, I wasn't able to talk about my service in Vietnam for a long time. Okay. Uh, what I started doing, I started uh, counseling Vietnam veterans, uh, people with post-traumatic stress, that kind of thing, working them through it because they, I realized they were broken. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, things come to you when you give back to your community. Uh, last year I was selected as one of the top 50 graduates in the history of Columbus State Community College. This year I'm on the list of nominees for the Ohio uh, Veterans Hall of Fame. Uh, but the thing is, we all try to give back. Uh, we don't want to be takers. We want to give back. And just understand that their service was honorable that they worked hard and it was under very difficult circumstances. Understand that and treat them that way. Uh, don't, don't treat them suspiciously right. because they're a veteran. In closing, would you share with me the story that you, you said the Gideons gave you Bibles? Yes. The New Testaments and you were talking about um, a certain psalm. Psalm 91. Uh, is a war psalm about protection of veterans. That uh, the Lord will protect you from the arrows uh, in combat, that people will fall on your left and your right. Uh, if you are going through a, a tough time, go to Psalm 91 and read Psalm 91. Read the promise that is given to you in that psalm, that God will look after you. That's very comforting. And uh, we would read Psalm 91 before we went out on every operation as a group. As a group. Out as out. a group, yes. Uh, Almost as a prayer. It, absolutely it was a right. prayer. Uh, but uh, And there were times when we were in bad situations where I asked my squad to pray because I knew that uh, the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. And uh, we'd read Psalm 91, we would pray. We, uh, I wouldn't permit uh, profanity in our unit at all. There were serious things we would do to people that if, if they were using profanity, we wouldn't, wouldn't put up with it. It's one of the things that I committed to when I wrote the books. The, the books have don't have profanity in them. Uh, the good guys are good guys, the bad guys are bad guys, and the good guys win. Right. Uh, and a friend of mine on the police department, when I told him that, he said, can you do that? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes, you could do that. Uh, but the, the, uh, the big thing is have a grounding in faith. Understand that God has a purpose for your life. And sometimes attaining those things in your bucket list have a purpose. Going to Walter Reed was an attainment of something on my bucket list, and uh, it helped somebody at Ohio State University. Yes. Um, on, on the Reynoldsburg Police Department, we had a, this is something I didn't tell you before, uh, we had a convenience store robbed three Fridays in a row. And my job was to prevent crime. Right. So I went to the chief and I said, this store is going to get robbed this Friday again. And he said, oh, he's not going to come back four sun Fridays in a row. And I said, you wouldn't have believed it last week if I came and said right. it was going to be three weeks. I said, let me sit on the store. So I went out and sat on the store. And I played chess on Monday nights at the Baptist Church over by OSU. And I'm playing chess one night with a guy, and he looks up at me, and he said, you don't remember me, do you? I said, no, I don't remember you. And he said, let me tell you what happened. 
He was the clerk at that convenience store that had been robbed three weeks in a row. So here I am, the fourth week, sitting out in front of his store, watching it, and a car pulls in, and a guy gets out with a gun. And it's the guy that's robbed the store three weeks in a row. So I drove over, very without my headlights on, right. very quietly got out, and stopped him before he went in to the convenience store and arrested him. Took him away. And this guy said, I was the clerk in that store that night. He said, I brought a pistol to work. I was going to shoot it out with the guy when he came in. He said, you saved my life. Wow. So that's what I mean by giving back. Right. Being in a situation where you can give back to the community, save a guy's life, not by throwing yourself in front of a car or something like that, just doing your job. Just doing your job. The guy said, you saved my life. Uh, as a crime prevention officer, I did a security survey of a home in Reynoldsburg. And the what you do is you look for weaknesses in a house. And I found that the, uh, the windows in the basement were his uh, security weak point. But I couldn't figure out how to better secure them than the little latches right. and that kind of thing. So I told him, I said, what you need to do is in the stairs leading up from the basement, there was a solid core door leading into his home. I said, get a deadbolt lock and put that lock on the door so that if somebody breaks into your basement, they can't get up into the regular part of your house. He did that. And about two months later, and I had left the department by then, he sent me a letter. A guy broke into his home, came up the steps, couldn't get into the living area of his home, and he worked nights, so he couldn't protect his, right. his family. But his wife heard the guy and called the police. The police came out. The funny thing was he couldn't get out the windows he had broken into because <laughs> they were too high up right. off the, the floor. And he sent me a letter, and he said, you saved my family. So we just want to give back to the community. And allow us to do that. Allow, allow us to be focused and uh, do what we can to uh, give back to our community. That, that's the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your service. Um, and I appreciate you taking time to share all of this with us um, so that people can know and hear and mm -hmm. listen. So I want to thank you for doing that.